Why is it you must have asked of I have, as I have, that in many situations our evangelistic efforts are often fraught with failure? Well, several reasons may be given, and I do not want to ever simplify, but one main reason is that we don't look like the Christ we are proclaiming. John Poulton, who has written about this in a perceptive little book entitled A Today Sort of Evangelism, wrote this. I think you will agree with me that it's well worded. The most effective preaching comes from those who embody the things they are saying. They are their message. Christians need to look like what they're talking about. It is people who communicate primarily, not words or ideas. Authenticity gets across and deep down inside people. What communicates now is basically personal authenticity. That is Christ-likeness. So let me give you an, another example. There was a Hindu professor in India who once identified one of his students as a Christian and who turned and said to him, if you Christians lived like Jesus Christ, India would be at your feet tomorrow. I think India would be at their feet today if we Christians lived like Christ. And there's another example from the Islamic world from the Reverend Iskandar Jadid, a former Arab Muslim. He has said, if all Christians were Christians, that is Christ-like, there would be no more Islam today. And that brings me to my third and last uh, point. If that is uh, Christ-likeness and the indwelling of the Spirit, I've spoken much tonight about Christ-likeness, but you're asking me, is it attainable? My answer is that in our own strength, it is clearly not attainable. But God has given us his Holy Spirit to dwell within us and to change us from within. William Temple, the Archbishop in the 1940s, used to illustrate this point from Shakespeare. You may know it. This is what he said. It's no good giving me a play like Hamlet or King Lear and telling me to write a play like that. Shakespeare could do it. I can't. And it is no good giving or showing me a life like the life of Jesus and telling me to live a life like that. Jesus could do it. I can't. But, he went on, if the genius of Shakespeare could come and live in me, then I could write plays like this. And if the Spirit of Jesus could come into me, then I could like I could live a life like his. Is that we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is help people who are far from God. Okay? Become disciples of Christ. Folks who are characterized by their increasing love for God and their increasing love for other people. That's how we'll define a disciple of Christ. So what we're trying to do in our churches is help people make this movement. And the way we go about doing that is we create a variety of programs and services for people to participate in. On the weekends, we hold worship services. On the weekends and throughout the week, we teach classes. Okay? We organize to get people into small groups, because that's a good thing. Fourth, we give care to people in need. And fifth, we do all this in a way that gives opportunities for people to serve, to volunteer. And you could add whatever you want to this list of different activities and programs for a church. Okay? 
The bottom line then is, here's how we think about doing church. This is our strategy. We try to get these folks engaged in these sets of activities. So participation is a big deal. Because we believe the more people are participating in these sets of activities with higher levels of frequency, it will produce disciples of Christ. People characterized by increasing love for God and other people. That's why every Sunday morning I sit up in my seat and ask the question, how many? How many people are here? It's because I need to know how many people are here to know whether or not I'm producing more disciples of Christ. I know that might sound crazy, but that's how we do it in churches. We measure levels of participation. As I mentioned in 2004, we did some research here at Willow. And then over the last year, we invited 30 other congregations to participate with us. We've now listened to over 20,000 people who attend these churches. And we've learned an incredible amount of things about what really helps them grow and how close they really are to becoming disciples of Christ. The first thing that we learned was is that increasing level of participation in these sets of activities does not predict whether someone's becoming more of a disciple of Christ. It does not predict whether they love God more or they love people more. One little one. Um, here's a, a kind of a continuum. And uh, here's a cross. And here are people who are pre-Christian, but who are figuring out Christianity in the context of Willow Creek Community Church. Seekers, investigators, okay? That's here. These are people who are just across the line, like beginning Christians. These are growing Christians. And then these are people who are fully devoted followers of Christ as they self-describe, okay? Now, we asked one question, which was, uh, how, how helpful is Willow Creek Church being to you? In, how much help are they being to you in these various areas, when you're in these areas, uh, in these stages of your life? Okay, so if this would be like 10, we're, you know, Willow's really doing well. For our pre-Christians, remarkably, and this was like good news, they were giving us like nines, going, I'm investigating Christianity, I come to this church, I love the services, I love what's offered to me, the resources, I like how the truth of Christianity is made relevant to me, so in a way I can understand it, rated us very high. Even the new Christians, it came down a little bit, but not that much. They were like, man, you helped me get in a group, you helped me with this, you helped me with that. It was all pretty cool. All right, then we get to growing Christians, and the scores start going down. And then we get to fully devoted followers of Christ, and the scores got scarily low. And I was like, that bothers me. That really bothers me. Like, like we're not helping them that much. So I said, why don't we do some focus groups, find out what's really going on. And they said, Bill, we did that. <laughs> said, All right, you're going to tell me about that too? <laughs> You're like, yep, put the gun away. It's all right. So they said, you know, a lot of people in this category, they're saying they're not being fed, that they want more meat of the word of God. They want more serious-minded scripture taught to them. They want to be challenged more and so. And I was like, it's hard for me to hear. We give, give messages on weekends. We give extremely challenging messages at our midweek service. We're one of the only churches in the United States that has a midweek service, a full-blown Bible teaching session in addition to what we do on weekends. We have small groups. We have classes. We have all this stuff. And I started getting a little irritated. I was like... I'll feed those people. I'll hire some old... <laughs> I'll hire some old seminary prof. I'll feed them till they barf. You know? So, <laughs> you should see me in my finer moments. So, anyway, they said, hey, Bill, that's really not... That's, that's sort of the presenting thing they're saying. We think we know what's really going on. So, Greg Hawkins, again, just brilliant guy. He goes, Bill, we've made a mistake. What we should have done at about this point, when people 
cross the line of faith, become Christians, we should have started telling people and teaching people that they have to take responsibility to become self-feeders. We should have gotten people, we should have gotten people, taught them how to read their Bible between services, how to do the spiritual practices much more aggressively on their own, because what's happening to these people, the older they get, the more they're expecting the church to feed them when, and in fact, the more mature a Christian becomes, a Christian should become more of a self-feeder. Okay? Things. We didn't have a hypothesis to test. We didn't know what the five were. But you spent a lot of time with these churches, looked at the data, interviewed them, talked to people on their staff, and there was these themes that emerged. The first one was they get people moving. Yeah, they yeah, get yeah. people moving soon as they get into their church yeah. and moving toward a, a discipleship journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That they make it very clear that you just sitting in a seat is fine, but it's almost like you walk in those churches and you sense you're on a moving sidewalk. Yeah. There's something yeah. happening yeah. and they're moving you toward the an introduction class, uh, the first base in a baseball diamond yeah, class yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah. Where, and, and they make it very clear that we're not here to make you a better Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist or whatever. We're here to make you a disciple of Jesus Christ. And here is the path that this church can help you do that. So they clarify destination right off the bat and give you a set of non-negotiable first steps to move you in that direction. Yeah, okay? yeah. So they get it going. Second thing is they embed the Bible in everything. They crave for the congregation to be actively engaged in Scripture. And it's not Somehow, from a legalistic, we all have to do this right, point of view, right, but it's, right. this is the bread of life, you know. Th this is what we need to exist. And you go to those churches, the way they do staff meetings, you're interacting with these pastors. It says this in Proverbs, it says yeah, you're with these people, yeah, it's yeah. soaked into their DNA. And yeah. that's evident in, that, in these churches. Yeah. The third thing is they uh, create owners of the congregation. Mm -hmm. It's not about, I go to church, they say, I am the church. Right, right. And they give away ownership. The, it's volunteerism on steroids yeah. and ownership on steroids yeah. with accountability on the backside. Yeah, yeah. But they, they, we are all in, we all have a role, I mean, and, and I know we all say that and we believe that. Yeah. These people live it out. Yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy. The fourth idea is they pastor the local community. Yeah. They see their ministry not as within the walls of their church, but they yeah. see their community. Now, we all say that and yeah, we minister to this community. These people are nuts. They partner with other churches. They partner yeah. with the yeah. government and other not-for-profit organizations to make a real tangible difference in the community. And they live with the tension that they're okay with their congregants serving outside yeah. the walls. Yes, yes. And they go, and you talk to them, they go, well, aren't you worried about not having enough volunteers to get it done? And they look at you like you're crazy. Like, yeah. we'll yeah. deal with that problem. Our people need right. to be deployed. Right. They need to be right. outside. And it's very consistent with the research we found that as someone moves from far from God to really Christ-centered, they are moving out into the world. They are owning the things that matter to Jesus. They're making a real difference. And then the thing that, I mean, was just so crystal clear. Those are the four kind of strategies or yes, concepts, and yes. they really work in a nice constellation the together. The fifth one then is but later at the center of it, huh. at the center of it, yeah. is a senior leader and a senior leadership team consumed, consumed with making disciples. Wow. I have never been with wow. a group of people who are so clear, focused, and determined to produce disciples for Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and they will challenge, and they will not let up, and it's very clear that they've taken the Great Commission completely seriously. Yes, yes, disciples yes, yes, yes. who obey yeah. all that yeah. you know, Christ commanded. Yeah.